I'm Dan Rundy. I, I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Um, I want to thank my friends, my panelist friends, for joining me on a conversation about uh, the role of higher education in public diplomacy and development. I'm, um, I came to this conversation, I've been involved with the World Economic Forum process, and there's been um, there's an interesting paper that's going to be released, uh, a bipartisan group uh, looking at some of the strategic assets of the United States. And one of the assets that uh, the large or broad spectrum of um, thinkers and doers agreed on was the important role of American higher education as a vector of global development, as a vector of American public diplomacy, in addition to all the other important things that our higher education system provides us. Um, and so I wanted to drill down a little bit further about that, that those two interesting, uh, the fact that it was such an, an important asset that was recognized by this group, but also uh, I wanted to explore a little bit the changing landscape of higher education and also understand uh, how different countries, what their expectations are, what they hope to get when, for example, Brazil is sending 100,000 students to study STEM outside of Brazil to train up uh, a whole cadre of technical experts. Most of them are going to go to the United States. Uh, I hosted the Pakistani planning minister on Friday, and his main ask was, I, we need to train up 10,000 American-trained Amer PhDs, Pakistanis as PhDs, and if they return to Pakistan, they'll help me change the, they will help Pakistan change the direction of its, of its future, basically. They will help steer the future of Pakistan. So it's intriguing to me that a broad s a spectrum of stakeholders see this system as important. At the same time, the higher education world is changing in all sorts of different ways. And I think we'll have a chance to, to talk about that and tease it out in this, this conversation today. I don't think this group needs a lot of introductions, but I'll just briefly uh, mention each of the folks who are here. Uh, I'm going to have my friend, Dr. Peter McPherson, who's the former president of Michigan State. He's the, the, the CEO of the American Public Land Grant University, the Association of Public Land Grant Universities. Um, he's also a uh, former administrator of AID and friend to all. So thank you for being here, Good Peter. Good to be here. My friend, Dr. Joe Duffy, the former president of American University. Thank you, Joe, for coming. And uh, is also involved with, uh, has been involved with the laureate system of private universities outside of the United States. This is one of the, the largest private university system outside the United States. He's also, I believe, the chancellor of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He was also the head of US Information Agency in the Clinton administration. Uh, my very good friend, Dr. Sophia Gere, who runs a very interesting international development program at Catholic University, and is an expert on measurement and evaluation, and is, uh, and, and has worked on, a whole, on sort of a, taking a broader look at how we think about measurement and evaluation. And uh, so thank you for being here, Dr. Geary. Really thank appreciate you. it. And then my good friend, Rob Henderson. Rob is an alum of uh, CSIS. He also served in the State Department. And he's with the Northern Virginia Community College System, which I think you'll, you'll see why I wanted Rob to be here when he shares about the Northern Virginia Community College System, because you'll be surprised how large it is and how international it is. And so thanks, Rob, for being here as well. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, my friend, uh, Peter McPherson to kind of kick this off because I know you, 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 you've sat in a number of different chairs that have looked at this and you continue to keep a pulse on higher education from your current perch at APLU. So thanks for being okay. here. The floor is yours, Peter. Well, it's good to see you. I look around the room and I see some folks I've known and worked with over the years. Uh, a few brief comments that higher education is key for growth in all countries, certainly including poor countries, that educating students here is important and, in fact, is very much a soft power uh, for what this country does. A core concept is educating, uh, the educated people are the foundation for growth. Well, let's think about that. You need reasonably sound economic policy, I'm not talking about detailed prescriptions, but 200% inflation doesn't do it. For growth, you need reasonably stable, sustained governance that's committed to broad-based development. And next, I think least talked about, is that you need institutions that work in a country. Uh, think about any community, with its hospitals, its sewage systems, its school systems, the private sector. 
all that institutional structure. What the, the common thread to economic policy, to government, uh, to institutional structures in the community are people. It's not static, it's not just a lines. It's really the people within those institutions, the degree of their education, training, competence. So a, a foundation of growth is, is the people. Well, and I, it's clear when we think about institutional structure, I'm just talking about eighth grade education, high school degrees simply are enough, whether it be a very poor country or whether it be our own community. And that's the reason from the very early days, the foreign aid program, really starting with point four, the Truman administration, uh, there was a big emphasis upon training people in this country building to in a range of 10,000 or so students here. It wasn't just short-term training, it was degree training, longer-term training. It clearly had an impact. I remember when I, I became administrator of AID in 1981, uh, early 81, and as I worked around the world, many, many countries at that time, a majority or a sizable minority of the ministers the leaders of the country had degrees from United States institutions. Well, by time when I got there in '81, this was all this was largely funded by by USAID. When I got there in '81, the number had shrunk to about 7,000 a year. And we made a, a a decision early on that we were going to drive this number substantially up. So what we said was, if you're going to have a major a project of any size approved by for AID funding around the world, you either had to have long-term training education in the project or explain why not. And that did marvels. Within, within a couple of years, we were up to 18,000 people at a high point and stayed that level. Now, in the late 80s, that number began to drop substantially and it stayed low for these decades. So it's been two, 3,000. The Fulbright program has grown some, grown a lot, but it never, of course, came close to making up these numbers. Well, why did it drop? Well, uh, we, have, we have adopted broadly a measurement of outcomes that was short and medium term. Mm -hmm. And of course, higher education, or for that matter, any education, it's hard to see impact from uh, income of poor people from a, to from a degree, in, in, and so that's been part of the rationale, but frankly, I think it's been a mistake for both economic growth reasons and for United States. In that same period when we were building up our, uh, the, the long-term train, long training, point four, uh, <clears throat> we also decided we were gonna build major institutions in agriculture, business, and so forth around the world. Uh, this was a huge effort, and, and that, that impact in people certainly remains, and in relationships is still there. The University of Minnesota still has a sizable cadre of faculty that still do work, uh, not paid for by the governments, I, in Morocco, for example. When I came to Michigan State, because of that building of that university back in the 50s, when I came to AID, and and uh, when I came to Michigan State in 1993 as president, uh, within a couple of weeks, there was a, uh, a little cohort of faculty that, that were still deeply involved in Mali from the days that we built that, uh, a major research university in that country. Uh, in fact, uh, they said, now Peter, you gotta understand all the work we're doing couple hundred thousand dollars a year from AID, but look at all the stuff we're doing. And by the way, we need to have President Conore, uh, when he, uh, uh, the current president of Mali at the time, get an honorary degree from Michigan State. <laughs> well, so as it worked out, we gave him this honorary degree, and when he retired uh, with a good and fair election in Mali as president, he spent a semester at Michigan State as a visiting faculty member. He'd been a, an academic before that. I mean, those are the kinds of relationships that, that we built, and, and uh, now that funding too dropped off in the, in the uh, 
uh, late 80s, early 90s, that too needs to be rebuilt. Now, uh, a quick figure about return on, on higher education, the World Bank, we traditionally thought uh, there'd been a, a folk wisdom that higher education didn't have a high return economically. The World Bank, a couple years ago, did a study looking at the return of higher education and uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, their determination was it was about 21.6%. It's a very careful, big study, a substantially higher return, incidentally, uh, than primary education. The poorer the country, the higher the return was in higher education. It, it isn't what people would automatically think. I, I, the, obviously, primary education is important. AID, in the last three years, has put about over $2 billion into reading and a fraction of that into higher education. I, I don't want to take away from reading, but I do think that the, the, the proportions and the emphasis have been wrong for purposes of, of building the country. I would make one last quick set of comments, and that is uh, the broader question of educating students in this country. Obviously, the world still sees the United States as an education institutions here as uh, of great value and great prestige. About a million students uh, were in this country last year, just short of that. 30 per 31 of them, percent of those, by the way, from China. Mm. Uh, uh, this number continues to grow, a little dip uh, a few years ago, but last year it was a growth of about 10 percent. Uh, I think uh, I think educating the students here is, by the way, it's a little bragging, ten of the eight of the ten largest uh, recipients or educators of foreign students are public universities. Mm. Uh, all the APLU members, of course, since they're all big publics. Uh, but it's uh, uh, our education system here continues to attract outstanding people, and I think that we should be continue to do so. It's good to be here, and fundamental, obviously you can see my fundamental premise is the, the economic importance of this uh, for the world is enormous. And I do think that it's a way for the United States to engage people in countries around the world in a fashion that, that strengthens us as a society. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I, I'm, I'm struck by a couple of your points, and if I ask former aid staffers, what the most important development projects they ever funded. If you ask AID alumni association members, they will say it was scholarship programs to higher education institutions in the United States. And, and was the other thing I was struck by is, and I mentioned this yesterday at another event, uh, Steve Radlett wrote a, one of the seminal papers on development called Emerging Africa with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf talking about the several dozen African countries that were succeeding, that are, that are succeeding, and there are a growing number of African countries succeeding, and he talked about five, they talked about five factors of those success, one of which was democracy, democratic governments in the most part, but the other was a trained cadre of technocrats. Now, I tried to do a little bit of a, I haven't succeeded in doing this yet, but I, I, I suspect if one were to look at Anglophone, Africone, and Luc Anglophone, Lucifone, and Francophone countries, in Africa, I looked at, say, presidents of central banks, economy ministers, prime ministers, um, sort of senior technocratic leadership and those functions. Most, more than 50% have been probably trained either out, outside of their country, and many of them in the United States or the UK or France or so. But particularly in Latin America. And in Latin America, America, certainly in the United but, States. But uh, in Africa as well. So. Asia. E exactly. Those early days, development Asia. days of Asia. Exactly. Uh, they were uh, critically important. Well, thank you. Jo Joe, thanks for being here. Uh, you had, you know, you've been at a number of higher institutions of higher learning. You're still associated with, um, with Laureate. Um, you also served in government and helped uh, to provide an image of the United States outside of the, the United States through USIA. So I know this is a topic close to your heart, so thanks for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Peter, have you seen the latest issue of Harvard Magazine? No. Checking out this the other day. Save our public universities. Uh, that's the leading. That's the leading article. Uh, I thought you might. Uh, this is the one where they're 
the states are cutting us. Well, yes. that's the issue, core I of it. I, I did see a, uh, a brief uh, look at it. Yes. I, uh, I want. I'm probably going to take the most contrarian view up here. I don't think the world is now in a situation where we look at the rest of the world and say, oh, look what we could do for you. Our message has to be, look what we might be able to do together. I think that the culture uh, has really shifted dramatically. And that is part of the issue we face in higher education. It's understanding that. I have to, let me tell a, I have to just tell a personal story. I, <coughs> Bill Clinton and, and Hillary worked for me in 1970 when I ran for the Senate in Connecticut, and they were students at Yale, <laughs> along with a lot of people who are now prominent in his campaign and Hillary's campaign, the Podestas and others. When Bill uh, was elected president in 1992, uh, uh, he came to Washington the first time. Pamela Harriman had a, a party for him, and as I went through the line, he said to me, is there anything, any position in the government you want? Wow. My wife and I went home and I began to think about it. I decided to take the position of the director of USIA. There could have been others because I, I was obsessed with the idea that the end of the Cold War was changing the whole nature of the way we must relate and understand the world. And uh, so I, that was a bit of a troubling notion to take into USIA. Uh, I was saying we should stop trying to win hearts and minds. We should spend more time trying to explain America to the world because it's become so transparent. I have dealt with China for many, many years, and the uh, young people in China continue to, even these days, to send me these emails. Can you explain this Tea Party? I went on the internet and watched one of their meetings the other day. That's the world that we're now living in. Uh, and it changes the nature of education as well. I don't know if many of our that's the, I would say that edu educating the faculty about uh, teaching and education is as important as anything we do in our universities today. Drew Faust, the president of Harvard, is a good friend. She just told me that every time Harvard redesigns an auditorium, or in building the new ones as they are at the law school across the river, they make every seat in the aisle pivot four ways. And say to the professor, start your lecture for you know, 15, 20 minutes, then give the students five minutes to talk and exchange and, and come back. The, the pedagogy is a very important issue, which is, I think, a bit neglected. Uh, perhaps out of our sense of, of triumphalism and kind of looking down. I think our universities are very important in the world, but no, not these days looked quite the way we thought during the Cold War. Well, it was, it's the end of the Cold War. Uh, it, it wasn't as a, some uh, one said once the end of history. It was the, the beginning of a new era. And that, the impact and meaning of that for our universities is very important. I was telling Peter of the story of what Yale happened to Yale recently. I've been talking with the president of Yale about this when they went to Singapore. To, they said, we'll, we'll build a liberal arts college in the University of Singapore. When they arrived, the Yale faculty said, wait a minute. We see, the, we see the culture in quite a different way than you do. We'll have a partnership with you about liberal, uh, liberal arts. Well, the faculty, I'm sorry about this. The faculty were, nothing but my, the faculty were very alarmed. They said, wait a minute, that's not what we came here to do, and we all won't have our freedom in this country. Well, it's actually turned out to be a big success. Yale now takes faculty and students there often because it's a, an, an open perception of the world. Uh, I'll, I'll leave. I'll be ready for questions later. Let me just say I also now get lots of inquiries overseas, uh, particularly well, China. I've been to many times, but in, in, in Europe and others. Can you help uh, with a recommendation? My son wants to go to Harvard. 
Harvard loves to have students from outside because they pay the full tuition. <laughs> but I respond back to them and saying, you know, I wouldn't go to Harvard for an undergraduate education. And they say, well, where would you go? I told them a school that I've now enrolled six or seven Chinese, I think it, Arizona State. They are thinking more about pedagogy and what happens in the classroom. So I see, in a sense, the re-education of the faculty. It's also a swirling world. I just brought along the Chronicle of Higher Education is an extraordinarily important publication in higher education. The recent thing they've done is what they call the Trends Report for 2016, worth looking at in terms of the, the, of the changing world. And before we go anyplace else, we have to understand that. Uh, so I'll leave it there. OK. Well, thank you, Joe. Thanks for being here. Uh, uh, Dr. Gary, thanks for being here. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. No. I think you've built a really interesting program at Catholic University on international development. I've spoken several times to, your, uh, to many of your students. It's probably one of the most international programs of any, of any program in Washington. So I really appreciate you being here. OK. Um, I just have four ideas that I want to toss um, and build on what Peter and Joe say. Um, the first, well, the, the first point I think is um, we are in a globalized world, and the, the, to some extent, the temptation is why do we need to bring students here? They can get access to everything in the internet and know. And in here, I will bring uh, build on what Joe mentioned that no social media, web TV can replace the personal exposure to American educational system. Having been a foreign student myself, I think uh, I can speak to that in a, in a special way. Um, why? Because it's not exchange of information. <coughs> that can be done in many ways. But it is the content of that information in a, in a con cultural context, a view of life, um, a one-on-one -on -one personal um, exchange that in most of the countries does not exist. You were talking about pedagogy, lectures, boring lectures, just challenging a professor. It's just not something we do overseas. Um, in the United States is part of the education process and it's extremely, it's, it's amazing what does. Um, I see this, I have 70% of my students from overseas representing all the continents. And this is something that makes a huge difference for them, especially when you're thinking about how am I going to change society, go back from any ministry or private sector, and how are we going to make a difference in development. Second point is the long-term impact that it has. Um, I think that uh, it has been said here, a lot of money has been put into Fulbrights and exchange programs, but I will bid in something that Peter mentioned earlier. Um, I served in the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy for eight years. And this was a big discussion at the time because the shift was, well, let's do more media and more noise and more what I call the Hollywood approach. Uh, instead of investing so much money in you know, Fulbrights and undergraduate education, and I think that's a huge mistake uh, for all the above that I said before. And unfortunately, we see that more and more. And that, uh, along these lines, I want to say the international, inter internationalization of education is reality, right? How many universities in the United States have placed uh, universities overseas? whether they are Middle East, Asia, Latin America, a little bit less perhaps than other countries. And that is not a substitute for learning in the United States, precisely because of the context base that I think is so important. <coughs> Last but at least, do this together. I think it's interesting the amount of countries, and some has been mentioned already, Brazil, China. I would like to ask Saudi Arabia that invest has at this point 280,000 students studying in the United who, States. Who does? 280,000. Wow, wow. Um, that's not a small number for a country of the size of Saudi Arabia. Um, so countries are very investing in the United States. And I have to say from a personal experience, 
um, the, a, a big change is effective. Uh, and I can tell you many anecdotes, but I'm just going to tell you two. Uh, one of the things we've done was to evaluate Aramco's um, young leadership program. And that came about because a student of Saudi Arabia came to my office one day and said, you know what, Dr. Aguirre, we don't know how to work. We waste our time. This is a social welfare system. This doesn't go anywhere, right? We need to do something about it. And, and it was a Saudi student who began a, a process of change. Uh, the same happened with the infrastructure, the young housing program in Saudi Arabia. A student came and said, this is not sustainable. This is not the way it works, right? Everybody cheats, never mind plagiarism, right? Uh, and, and we went from there uh, into introducing a more whole modification on the infrastructure of housing policy in Saudi Arabia. So even in countries where you think it's much harder <laughs> to effect change, the fact of sharing a process of education, not only um, with Americans, but with others within an American system is fascinating. And with this, I'm going to say one more anecdote and a stop. Um, I teach a course, it's economic, integral economic development, the whole view of our program. And one day, the issue of corruption came up, we were analyzing it, and in two minutes my class was divided in Latinos fighting among themselves, Arabs talking about whether the Quran allowed for, for, for um, presence and if those presents were allowed to be rejected or not in the other side of the class, the Francophone and Africans screaming at each other, you know, in another area. It was a fascinating uh, exchange within the regions and across cultures and then I have a 25% of American body looking at this in awe. They could not believe what they were hearing, looking, That's discussing, wild. right? And suddenly they jump on the wagon. But what it was fascinating to me after that, and that's my last point, is that it's equally important for Americans to be exposed to this. The richness um, that I see in my students uh, that they acquire because of this exchange is immense. And then they go on to do a very effective development uh, work because they understand other cultures and, and, and a ways of thinking and engaging in a long-term way. So anyway, that's what I'm going to stop. And well, thank, thanks, Dr. Gere. I, uh, studying overseas changed my life. I learned Spanish at Dartmouth, and then I lived in Spain for a period of time, and then I went to grad school at Harvard, the Kennedy School, and met my then girlfriend, now spouse, the first day of class, and she's from Argentina, and it was clear that if, if, if we were gonna get married, I was gonna have to move down there, and so, which I did, and, and I became a fluent Spanish speaker, so, it, and I can think, and in her family, she has two brothers who have PhDs in economics, uh, one's teaching at MIT now, and one's a senior research economist at the Inter-American Development Bank, and my father-in-law learned English from books and came uh, to study economics at Harvard and then went on to be, have a very distinguished public service career in Argentina and help change the country. So, so I, think, uh, I think these sorts of anecdotes, if you multiply them by about a million, you get a sense of sort of the, the mass of change. It certainly changed me as an American, but it certainly changed, you know, I, I was changed by it. So I think it's certainly very, I, I agree, I think it's a two-way conversation, and, and, and to your point, Dr. Gary, we, we were having a, a lunch conversation last week with, with Joe Duffy and with the Pakistani planning minister, and Joe, you were saying that universities really value the participation and, uh, of foreign students you know, even more so than 20 years ago, and that as, in addition to sort of globalizing and changing the pedagogy that you were talking about, that many universities are globalizing their curriculums in all sorts of different ways, and this allows, this exchange allows and facilitates that. So, so I think certainly that, that rings true. What you said, Dr. Gary, rings true for me because I've lived it, so thank you. So Rob, thanks for being here. Uh, welcome home. Yeah, is CSIS is still your home, and thanks for being here. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to have public land-grant universities. I wanted to have voice of private universities. Uh, religiously affiliated universities, and I wanted to have community colleges represented as well. And so I thought Rob, given his various his past lives as well as his current life, could could provide that perspective. So, so Rob, would you first tell us how many people study 
at Northern Virginia Community College, and how many is that? The, and what is the equivalent? And how many faculty do you have at, at uh, Northern Virginia Community College? Northern Virginia Community College has 78,000 students. We have 6,000 faculty and staff. We have six full campuses, and we are the IT infrastructure for the Virginia Community College system, serving probably a quarter million. We're not really sure. How many languages? <laughs> how many languages are spoken at Northern Virginia Community College? 180 different languages. Wow. Over 25 percent of our faculty and our students are foreign-born. This is America's college. We are on the cutting edge. We are kind of a new look to community colleges. We're large, we're semi-urban, we're affluent. We are diverse in every conceivable uh, definition of that particular term. And we are right here on your doorstep. So if you need some cooking classes or something, <laughs> if you want to come across the, the river. Ethnic and, cooking classes. Exactly. And uh, sign up for your commercial driver's license. You can do it. You can get it right here. You want to drive motors. I won't go that way. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. Dan, for inviting me back here. Let me, I, I've got to come clean. I've got a checkered past, okay? I was a staffer at uh, CSIS when I just got out of grad school. I grew up with guys like Mike Samuels and uh, Chet Crocker. Chet was not only one of my bosses here, but he was also my faculty advisor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Then we went into the State Department and had a lot of fun doing things. I was in the I.O. Bureau. And then I went into something, a very strange little outfit called the National Endowment for Democracy, which Joe Duffy helped fund. And so two of the people on this stage have funded places where I've worked. I've worked in over 44 different countries. I am a program officer, I'm a field officer. That's, that's what I do best. Uh, UNDP, you, don't even, you, don't, you probably don't even know this. I'm rated as a chief technical advisor for electoral processes. I've worked in 44 different countries. I am an Africanist by training, and I'll speak up. Thank you. Um, so I come to this from a field point of view, but I also come to it from a strategic analyst point of view, because I was trained by guys like Dave Abshire mm -hmm. to think about it in the larger context. So I've got, a, I've got a mixed background. I don't come out of education, really, although I was educated. I come out of places like USAID, USIA, uh, NED, UNDP, IIE, and the Center for the Study of the Presidency. Go back to Dave Abshire again. I'm delighted to be here on the platform with, with these distinguished speakers. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, NOVA. We, we manage grants. I'm, I'm in the Office of Grants, so I help find mastodons, uh, kill them, strip the flesh, and feed the tribe, OK? I'm a grant writer. Uh, but I'm also a strategist, and I help train faculty. I do compliance for the college. So I get into management of grants. And what I wanted to do was talk about the capacity of the modern American community college to provide technical assistance. Dan asked me to think about public diplomacy, think about the strategic components of it. Well, let me tell you, the strategic need is alive and well because the capacity building requirements in the developing world for things like education, for training, for the ability to produce a workforce have not gone away. They haven't even been adequately Increased. addressed. We, what we see in our globalized economy is something that I saw in, uh, in South Africa in 2012. I had to, because I'm a program guy, they will throw me into where I'm needed. And we had a USAID funded skills This for, is NVCC this funded. This is NVC, this is through ACE, USIA money, through ACE to provide technical assistance to uh, for, uh, higher education and training colleges, which is one of the uh, community college equivalent systems in the Republic of South Africa, to help some schools down there do some things in Limpopo and in um, uh, the Northern Cape. The point is very simple. We don't go there preaching, this is how we do it in the US. We go there saying, here's how we approach it. What is your problem and how do you approach it when we're talking about developmental math, developmental English? And this is the basic stuff. This is what community colleges do. They bridge the gap between the gaps that exist in all of our education system, fill them in, and get the people moving into the higher education tracks. We are the feeder schools for the University of Michigan, for everyone else. We put, more of our, we put more undergraduates into George Mason University than they bring in as freshmen, except we bring them in the sophomore year, okay? wow. sophomore, junior Amazing. year. Amazing. We're a transfer school. We have very low rates of graduation right across the country, very low rates of graduation. Why? Our kids transfer out, or they go get jobs, or they do something. 
community college education, the enrollment numbers are countercyclical with the larger economy. I don't want to go into the, the whole structure of the business model for community colleges, but the simple fact of the matter is when the demand is greater, when the economy is on the decline, people are looking for alternatives. And where do they go? They need the basic education, the certificates, the training, the kinds of things that will get them in. Let me talk just a little bit about the government of Brazil and the very generous $9 million grant they gave to Northern Virginia Community College to manage something absolutely new in the American landscape, which is so sorry, effective. So sorry, the government of Brazil wrote you a check. They wrote, wrote us wrote, a check. They actually did. Minutes. They wrote the damn check and sent and gave it to us. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> you have gave the it money. to our director of international programs, and we gave it to the foundation, and they just dropped their jaw. They, didn't, they don't see checks like that very often. For 100,000 in science, you know, science without borders, 100,000 strong, that's what the government of Brazil is funding. One of their programs. They have several programs like that. We have a small piece of it. A lot more money has gone to Harvard. A lot more money has gone to some other schools that you'll recognize. Our piece is for 400 students to come from Brazil to top up their English language training and to get familiar with American pedagogy and training and then get into the larger universities so they will then become part of that science without borders and go back to Brazil and yeah. go to Brazil. Where the magic sauce is, what the comparative and competitive difference is for our institution is that we have a consortium of nine other community colleges across the country that help us do this. And these are large, capacious organizations, larger than uh, Northern Virginia. We're the second largest multi-campus community college. We're not sure who the largest is. They fight that out all the time. It's either Miami-Dade or it's you know, Maricopa County or it's the Los Angeles District or something else. And the point is very simple. These are, or these are institutions <coughs> next to major American urban areas with thousands and thousands of students tremendous teaching capacity, and the ability to handle in a professional way the exchange and education that is paid for by these governments. Now, we also do this for the State Department. You've got, I notice in here in the introduction materials, you've got us at about $2 million in grants from the State Department. It's about 24, but that's okay. Close enough. What's the point? You we get manage, $24 million a year yeah, from the State Department. We, we manage, well, not a year, but over a period of years. Okay. We manage that with consortia of other community colleges. And we have the capacity to do that. Other colleges in the country, community colleges, have the capacity to do that. That's the comparative advantage that the United States brings to this question of public diplomacy. I'm a field officer. I've seen this stuff up close and personal in Africa, in Latin America, and elsewhere. I'm going to wrap it up. He's okay. giving me that, that wiggle right yeah, now, yeah. but I've got to stop. <laughs> the point is, get the middlemen out of the way. Do like with like. Do what the old National Endowment for Democracy did in terms of allowing political parties, uh, the associations for uh, fine, you know, uh, center, uh, chambers of commerce and labor unions, get out of the way, let that technical assistance go directly from like institution to like institution because we understand our counterparts' problems because we have the same problems and we can speak to them in their language. That is one of the, I don't know, for some reason we seem to have kind of gotten out of that business but what I saw USA I do very well uh, in South Africa was get out of the way and let that communication occur. So now, in at least four colleges in, in uh, South Africa, there is some really interesting developmental math, developmental English, and student support services that are happening. We could have spent the rest, we could have spent five more years there working on questions of financial aid, working on questions of how do you teach these different career building sets of skills that will allow those kids to actually get jobs, et cetera. I'm sorry, I don't Thanks. mean to okay, wander Rob. all over the place, but the key is look at the strategic assets that we have. If we're talking about public diplomacy, let's leverage U.S. strategic assets that are very large, okay. they're very capacious, inside our institutions of civil society. Thanks, Thank Rob. There. Thank you. So I think what I think is interesting is, is that the context is changing where there's the, the demands are changing where countries like Brazil or even Pakistan are saying we want to, we have our own resources and we want to buy in on our own or in partnership with universities. Universities are globalizing their curriculum, they value this. Um, at the same time, there's increasing capacity in developing countries, a little bit to Joe Duffy's point about um, they're developing their, their a series of very high quality institutions either built over a period of time, whether it's through Michigan State or through through institutions that, that, that Yale or others that are either creating campuses. So there's a, the, the landscape is changing. 
the one question that hasn't come up I wanted to ask you all, and then I want to open it up to the audience, is the issue of the internet. There's been sort of this changing landscape in terms of internet courses or taking classes online. So I wanted to hear from Peter McPherson and then just, just a couple of you about this. What well, I, I'd, I'd like to argue that there isn't nearly the capacity, particularly in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and there has been uh, over a 25-year period, there are three times more students or more. I uh, think if, uh, if uh, University of Connecticut grew by 300% over 20, 25 years, or Michigan State, wow. which would make it 150,000 students. I mean, you walk into, you walk into uh, a major university in Kenya or, or, or Tanzania or so forth. So there's a huge capacity issue for faculty members, uh, for facilities, and, and I think that they're, they need some help in a range of ways. Now, it isn't sort of a colonial going to do it. Universities, I, I, I think you'd be pleased what we're doing now, Joe. For example, the new university that at Ohio State and a, a group of universities is building in Tanzania as an agricultural college. As to the internet, well, this is a great tool. I think of when I was trying to figure out where to play sorghum research that we were doing in a big way, whether it should be in Sudan, the researchers in Sudan, or it should be on Purdue's campus. Now you now you do some of both, but you would have the capacity to link. It's not it's not supplanting higher education. No, it's and the, of course part of the problem is you don't always have internet connect connectivity too. But that's, high, as at NOVA, uh, the internet can play an important role, but doesn't replace the faculty totally either. Joe, can I just ask you to comment on, I first met you more than 10 years ago through the Laureate conversation. And Laureate has, I don't know how many students, you'll tell me it's in the hundreds of thousands outside of the United States. And I think, I would agree with you if you were to argue that a laureate produces a very, a, a very fine product and it, it's in places like Panama or other countries in the world and it's designed, it's something akin to sort of in between a community college and a, and a, and a you know, it's focused on sort of professional degrees. They're not, you, you guys aren't, laureate is not turning out art history majors, it's turning out accountants and maybe, and no, nothing against art history, I like art history, but I think, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. So. How does that phenomenon in the developing world, how does that change sort of the demand or the attractiveness of the American university system? <clears throat> well, it's clearly uh, uh, produced, we have, we have a generation of students who see more clearly the United States, and, but they see the world, they, they uh, are not uh, uh, perhaps as uh, caught up in, uh, in a, in a obsession with the triumphal nation. Uh, we have a university of, for women in Saudi Arabia. And I have uh, several of my students, one of whom is the first woman to be the governor general of the Arab UK Chamber of Commerce. I invited her to come over and speak at American University on women in the Arab world uh, about 15 months ago. Her chief message to students and faculty was, we're not waiting for you to save us. You know, we're, we're going to do this ourselves. I think an understanding of that uh, is something we need more of right now. I've left uh, a number of organizations I was involved with for the last four or five years to get involved with an organization in this city called the World Affairs Council, which spends a good bit of time, a lot of young, young leadership, spends a good deal of time on the distinction between international higher education and global higher education. They are quite different perspectives if you stop and think about it. The, uh, <clears throat> how do I define global higher education? Well, I'll tell a story about the youngest prime minister in recent history. Uh, I, I worked with Gordon Brown, who was a I'm sorry, the foreign minister, Gordon Brown in London. He appointed a man a few years ago named David Millibrand as foreign minister. You can imagine David gave his first speech on YouTube, and he said something I've never heard a foreign minister say before. One of my goals as the foreign minister of the United Kingdom 
is that more people who live in London will understand what the world looks like if you live in India. I think that there is a difference in the, in the, in the way we perceive the goal and role of higher education. And it has to change Americans, uh, a little bit of kind of an obsession for kind of, uh, you know, well, well, kind of looking down on the world as, as, a, as a new world of uh, cooperation and working together. And that's, of course, what's happening in the government. Uh, but I'll leave that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sophia, I wanted to just ask you, if you would, um, I've just been struck by how international your classes are. Could you just, how, how, how did that come about? How did all these, how did all these folks come to you? What, what, and when they come to you, what do they say as to why they want to come to the United States or why they want to come to Catholic University? Um, I think that is the nature of our program that attracts foreign students. Uh, Americans as well, but 75%, as I said before, are foreigners. Why? I think that because we speak a language that those who live in the development world know that is needed. Uh, we talked about integral economic development. We emphasize the importance of relationships, interpersonal dynamics, and uh, extends college institutions, calling human capital, college social capital, and, and we measure that, and they know that we need it. Uh, this is something that consistently comes up. Um, they translate that in the way they, they carry on the impact evaluations they have to carry as part of the program. And I think that's the major issue, why? And what they find fascinating is they themselves also internationalize, internationalize themselves because, as I said, we will have very much 25, 25, 25 percent kind of cross-section Latin America, Sub-Sahara Africa, Asia, Europe. And they themselves say, well, I grew up in Latin America, never thought about these aspects of Africa, or these aspects of Asia, or these Africa Central um, of the Middle East, or whatever. So I think that is the approach uh, that makes them so successful. And then a lot of word of mouth. We have a lot of networking coming into the program because they were, so they told the cousin, the, the colleague, the, uh, and it grows in that way. R Rob, we were talking earlier about a uh, test of English as a foreign language. Can you just, is, is that one of the drivers of why people come to NVCC is to get to get to standards that they can then, are you, and you were sort of implying that in your comments. Just talk about test of preparation and the test of English as a foreign language. Well, it, it, the, the TOEFL test itself, everyone's familiar with it, and it has certain rankings and gradings and so on, and somebody comes in with a score, and they can pat, you know, they'll get a certain score in terms of their reading and their writing ability, and then they start to talk and they start to listen, and you, they're not able to participate in higher education. They simply don't have sufficient English grasp. But this leads to something that Peter was getting to, which is the lack of capacity in the developing world to deliver what is basically needed, which is fundamental instruction in various areas. One of the reasons people, people always come to community colleges, to technical colleges in the developing world to get a job. They want a certificate, they want some opportunity, but the institution has to be agile enough to keep up with the economy. Well, right now, when we're talking about the internet, the evolution of the requirements of the basic training components for people who are entry level uh, folk to go into the IT industry is advancing and moving very rapidly. Well, how does an institution that barely has what you know a dozen computers per campus, <laughs> and, not okay. internet. and 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 you know maybe they've got more instructors than they do computers. Mm -hmm. How do they keep up with the training requirements mm -hmm. that allow their people to be competitive in, a, in an increasingly globalized and increasingly uh, standardized set of requirements for working in that particular environment? One of the things that's happened. I'll, I'll stop talking here in a second is that uh, the National Science Foundation has put together for the United States something called CyberWatch, and it's a way to create centers for creating, for creating new generation of cyber warriors. Fabulous stuff, absolutely fabulous. Standards, testing, the methodologies mm. are standardized, they're put across, they're spread out, they're anchored in the community colleges across the country. It's a great program. These are the white hat hackers? Exactly. <laughs> Why can't that model of training be adapted and shared 
with institutions of higher education in the yeah. developing world in ways that allow them to deploy it in response to their economic demands, to their changing requirements for their educational needs. So let me open it up. There's been a very patient audience. I I'm going to call on a couple of people. If I don't see some hands, I want to hear from Ann Simmons-Benton. I want to hear from Patrick Fine, and I want to hear from other folks as well. But And this gentleman here in the front row. We'll start with you. Then I want to hear from Ann. Then I want to hear from Patrick. And then this gentleman back there. I'd like to thank CSIS for this program and all the programs that you do. But I think the linkage between public diplomacy and higher education is very, very critical. And America started just after World War II, the Fulbright program, the scholarship program. And that has uh, actually trained many of the world's leaders uh, who've come to America and learned a great deal about us. Uh, the funding for that program is, is a challenge right now. I think we're down to maybe 7,000 students in the Fulbright program. Uh, a lot of demands on funding. We have now about 5 million international students worldwide. About a million of them uh, this uh, at the present time are in the United States of America. We have about a 20% market share of these 5 million international students. Uh, but that's down from about 28% market share 10 years ago. Our market share has declined precipitously, and the Department of Commerce put out a top markets report on education. We actually have higher numbers, but everyone else is growing much faster. The UK, Canada, China, Australia, they are going after uh, these international students. And uh, we have about 20 million higher education students in the entire system in America. We have the best higher education system in the world in the United States, 4,000 colleges, universities. Uh, we have uh, now the biggest American higher education system laureate, about a million students uh, globally. Uh, but how do we take this to the next level? How do we stop this erosion of market share that we're having? And what, what, what can we do? Because there are just so many wonderful things about public diplomacy cooperation, spreading democracy, American mm -hmm. values, uh, growth development. Thank you. So, okay, so that's going to, I'm going to bunch these questions together, but what can we do to take it to the next level as we're losing market share? I want to hear from Ann Simmons-Benton from Arizona State University, and she didn't know that someone was going to plug Arizona State University. Thanks, Joe. She's going to send the check later. Right, right, right. I've only been there a couple of months, but thank you very much. Um, uh, having sat in different seats at USAID um, and other places, uh, and having just come back from Jordan as the chief of party for a $46 million competitiveness program, I learned a lot about US education and the long-term relationships it builds and the leaders it builds in countries. And I really do think, looking back, and I was at aid when we kind of stopped funding that higher education because it didn't have those return on metrics. But if we look at those longer term metrics, you will see leaders, you will see Fulbrighters and Humphrey scholars who really understand and have become leaders in a different way. So how do we now do that in such a way that we also learn more in the US about what we've given to them and work together to solve those problems? So how do we, how do we tell that story? How do we capture that, that learning as well? So we hold that, hold, I'm gonna put that in the parking lot because I wanna hear from Patrick Fine, and then the gentleman behind Patrick Fine. Thanks. My questions really build on the two previous comments. Um, so you've done a good job of describing the role of American higher education in a globalized world and the value that it brings. But I hear you talking more about what I would cl call private diplomacy, not public diplomacy. So you're talking about the way um, our system attracts foreign students who are mostly students who are wealthy enough to come to this, uh, this country to, uh, to take advantage of our higher education system. But you haven't said much about the role of public education. Peter, you mentioned you know, the soft power represented by the system, but I guess my question is, are we taking advantage of that soft power as a nation if you look at the decrease that you pointed out in the, the um, support for the public support for bringing students here, especially students from poor countries, from disadvantaged settings, and you see that decrease, what should we be doing 
as a uh, community to take advantage of that soft power so that we have effective public diplomacy as well as private diplomacy, or does public diplomacy not really have a place now because you've got such a big private um, set of funders channel bringing yeah. students here, but those are students who are, who are by and large wealthy. So you get elite capture there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to come back to that because I think that is, I think that's one of the critical questions. There's a gentleman had his hand up here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marcelo de Jesus. I am from Argentina. Uh, the reason I came is uh, because part of the invitation says in which way United States and other countries can benefit each other. I'm one of the beneficiaries of these exchange uh, programs. And I say, I think the main benefit is an experience of life, mm. not exactly the, the, the academic life. Yeah. And I, I think I have, uh, knowledge is going to be global, but the community in which the knowledge uh, develops is not. It's something essential from country to country. And I have different, different examples. When, when I came here, the, the Berlin Wall was still alive. So I was sharing life with students from communist countries. And they were experiencing this uh, thing of going to the supermarket and have four different brands of milk, eight different brands of juices, or competing prices for buying uh, gas. Another thing is the American community can benefit from, from the foreigners. They learn with our eyes how they all behave. I have the reverse situation than from Daniel Randi because my wife is from the United States and we were living in, in Argentina. And I began reflecting through her questions, how we dress, the way we talk, and I think the same happened with the American students I was sharing life with. It, with my comments and the other Europeans' uh, comments about the American life. Another thing is, there are different United States. There's, in general, when the tourists come, they go to New York or to <laughs> Disneyland. But in general, when you come to study, you go to different environments. So you learn that there is a south and there's a north. I learned, for example, that in Virginia, where I was living in Charlottesville, you were more likely to get a ticket for speeding if your place was from New York or Boston, but not if you were coming from Virginia or Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what they told me. That in my case, living in a very small town, or city, I don't know, Charlottesville, um, I would, was dying to, to see some nightlife, going to New York, for example, or Washington. And I was inviting other, other people to come with me and say, are you crazy? Why am I going to this crazy world of, of New York? So there are people who live, like to do other, other kind of lives, different from, from the, just one United States. Thank you. I certainly dress better because I married my wife. It definitely stepped up my, I wear better ties and she keeps an eye on me. And so it was one of the, the cultural benefits of, of marrying an Argentine. So if I dress better, it's because I give my wife all the credit. But the, the, I take your point. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd love to hear from the four of you. Just to, I think these are some very thoughtful comments, insights, and questions. And I'd just like to ask each of you to to respond. I'm going to start with Rob and we'll go down this way. Sure. Let me just uh, cut right to the question about public diplomacy because I completely agree. There is a strategic asset that the United States has that it's not effectively deploying. And, and that is the ability to use the knowledge, the capacity of these wonderful institutions that we have in the United States to help build the capacity in the developing world where it's really needed. We are never going to be able to train a sufficient number of people to actually drive development in the developing world except in unusual circumstances. Can we help them build the institutions so they can meet that economic need? Yeah. Maybe we can. Yeah. We have to put resources into it though. Okay. Okay. Sophia? Um, I would say two things. Uh, one is uh, 
We have to remember that education is a long-term investment. Um, I think the temptation is always, I want, and, and perhaps addressing your point, we want immediate re response, right? And no, it takes 10 years to that person to be Blair. I mean, to give an example of many Fulbright's IVs, et cetera, right, around the world. So it is a long-term investment, but I will, this is my eternal ritornello, development is a long-term investment. If we really want sustainable development, if we really want public diplomacy, this is not overnight, it takes time, and we need to invest. We need to look for that talent and invest. Going back to the issue of public-private, uh, just judging for students I've seen, and because I sat in several review boards for foreign students, et cetera, and the service I did in public diplomacy, I concentrated on culture and education, so I oversaw a lot of these programs. I think it used to be the elites who got the, those Fulbrights, those programs, it's not longer the case. I think that um, there, there's a lot of work with reinforcing <coughs> English in, in other type of colleges to make people a part, to go into the competitive programs that before were not there. So I think we are going in the right direction in terms of your public investment. I, yes. Thank you. Joe? Let me talk about the elephant in the room, which I, I wish Bill, uh, uh, Bill Fulbright were here. I, he reached out to me when I was a young maverick in jail in the civil rights movement, opposing the war in Vietnam, and we became quite close. I was really literally sitting by his bed as he died. But we're in a different America now. If you look at Obama's recent budget, you see that he is having to deal with the fact that we have an enormous debt. It has to do with not having paid for wars for 50 years. And he's trying to put a budget together for a nation that has more people in prison than any other advanced nation in the world and growing poverty. So those elements are there as we think about our role uh, in the world and, uh, and the programs that we put together. That is a, a, a reality that it's a our constraint. leaders are going to deal with. It's a, it'll be, you're saying it's a constraint on the sorts of things we can do. Well, I think we all need to be realistic about, uh, yes, uh, it is a constraint. And it, makes, it ought to make us focus down on what are the most central and critical things we can do uh, realistically. Yeah, I, I take your point, Joe. I, um, when we were talking with the, the planning minister last week, he was saying, we, the Pakistanis, are going to put up money to train these 10,000 PhD students. We don't have enough to train all 10,000, but we'd like to find some corporate money, some Pakistani diaspora money. We'd like to try and get some universities to help us with some, some private funding on their own. And, the United States has the largest Fulbright program, in, funds the, is the largest budget for Fulbrights, my understanding, is with Pakistan. Um, and it's more of a one-way thing because it's hard to get Americans to go to Pakistan. Uh, I've been to Pakistan, it's actually better than the, you know, it's, I had a very nice experience in Pakistan and, and so I think they get an unfair rap, but, but the point is, we recognize, I think to Joe's point, that we have constraints and that there aren't those sort of resources. And I do think the other thing, one of the other elephants in the room, I think it was a little bit what Patrick Fine alluded to is, I think that in the education, the development education community, there's a bias which if you have one marginal dollar to spend it on basic education as on opposed to higher education because of concerns that it is a, an elite subsidy. And so I do think this issue is real, and I think it's easier to go up to the hill and say, do this for the little kids, and it's very emotionally satisfying, it's very congenial, and it's important. I would, however, argue, I think, I'd like to believe, and we've done some research on this here at CSIS, about domestic resource mobilization, that there's an increasing amount of ability of many countries, even in Africa, to pay for much of their own basic human needs. It doesn't mean they are, are paying for all their basic human needs, and the, ki the kinds of, the kind of requests that you're getting from Brazil, where they're writing a $9 million check to the Northern Virginia Community Colleges, or the requests you're getting from Pakistan are different 
because their needs are different and their ability to finance their own development, it, they're able to at least partially fund their own development. So this, this is a changing world that we're in. So how we operate, so I think it's true, Joe, that there are fiscal constraints and I think a pull, a pull of gravity inwards, perhaps, and that at the same time, I think we also need to think about how we operate in this changed environment. So, so Peter, I want to give you the last word. Thank you for, for being here. We're going to spend a substantial amount of money of 40, in my view, in this new world. Under Ronald Reagan, where people thought it might be reduced, in fact, it increased. And I think in the years ahead. And George W. Bush had increased. Absolutely. I think in the years ahead, America will continue for a range of reasons to make resources available. Well, that's good because I need an employment program. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to hear the thank you. So thank I you think so much. these problems Joe comments on are certainly there. I, I would express them a little differently, I suspect, but are certainly there. But I think we're going to continue to be involved. And so the question is how we allocate them. And it seems to me that there are some major things we need to do. Now, I think uh, I, I, of course, appreciate that Rod Shaw was, for example, uh, much more engaged with universities in this country through research and other ways. Uh, I never was able to persuade Raj that he should substantial increase long-term training. I was never able to persuade him that we should substantially increase university partnerships with this country, with, it, with developing countries. I, I, there were some reasons for that, but uh, important to them, I always thought, was you couldn't measure the outcomes. We've gotten constrained uh, by the body politic here in such a ways that in some ways we no longer have development. We've, it, it comes, and, and I think we've got to deal with that. We'll have a new administration. This is always a time when people rethink things, at least sometimes. And I think we ought to get back to the idea that substantial increases in long-term training is important here, is important for those countries and important for us. And I think if we had a, a substantial increase in it, we would probably do it differently. There is more, there can be, because of technology, more work can be done there and here. Uh, it, could, it doesn't need to be as expensive as it would be without that. And I think it's time we, we really work at building these universities in developing countries. Now, Joe I, he makes the point, you got to, you, uh, people need to do things for themselves. I couldn't believe it that more strongly, but I also think when I walk through Dar es Salaam, the university there, Howie Selassie, and I don't see any computers, I don't see any books in the library, I, I, we got, they got some real problems. Mm -hmm. it's the, the issue is not we're trying to tell them what to do. Uh, the issue uh, is, is, more, is a lot more complicated than that, I think. So I, I hope with a new administration, not because the people are, are, are new, but because there's, there's always a time to rethink. And new opportunity. There's really always a time to rethink. And, I, and we deeply appreciate that, uh, that Shaw and I think Gail uh, now will be, continue to be involved with universities. But we need to rethink this long-term training, these partnerships, and how we measure outcomes. Because the, 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 the economic return the economists recognize, have documented, both on research and education, are very substantial. It just, you can't do it in five years. So, so thank you very much, Peter. I, I want to give, I do actually, Dr. Guerrero, you wanted to make, make one point. I, I think you've got a new evaluation assignment, we which is to have. help us. Which <laughs> we is do help that. Us. But she, she's already into it, right? That's how we do. No, but I want to say one thing about the cost. Uh, this is something I, I, I had plenty of discussions when I worked in the government. I think the government will serve it, so itself, and so do universities, uh, administrators, no offense to any, all of you who are uh, on the concept of marginal cost. The cost is not as high at the margin. We could have much more 
many, many more students enroll if we will think marginal cost, and we don't. And so we lose opportunities because of that. I think public universities in the last few years, because of cut state appropriations, have looked at that differently. I mean, I, this was before the recent reductions, but when I was there at Michigan State, uh, we had uh, faculty, we, we increased our faculty course loads increased by 11.3%. Mm -hmm. uh, how we did is a longer story. But we increased the student body by 5,000 students mm -hmm. uh, without increasing the total number of faculty. Uh, and, and, I, and I look around in recent years, public universities in the last 10 years have grown about 25% mm -hmm. in number of students. And that, a lot of that was because we could do it with, larger, with, uh, with current capacity. Okay, I think we should leave it there. Please join me in thanking the panel. This is great, thank you. Thank you.